Let's talk to the Bengals director of pro scouting, Steve Radicevich, about the Bengals prep and plans for this year's draft. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. We are very excited for the NFL draft here on Locked On Bengals. And we're going to have a good one today with Steve. And today's episode brought to you by Game Time, where you can save $20 off your first purchase of tickets with promo code Locked On NFL in the Game Time app. And to all the everydayers and those out there that make us your first listen, hope you're excited as we are. And James, I know you're excited too. Hell yeah, it's draft week. Let's go. It's here. We're ready to go. We have Steve Radicevich. You're going to hear from him in just a second. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, follow wherever you get your podcast, and we're locked, we're loaded. And we are ready for draft week. We hope you are too, and you can get ready with this podcast. So without further ado, Jake, by the way, shout out to Emily Parker for setting this up. Steve Radicevich, the Bengals director of pro scouting, uh, joined us. And uh, let's let's get to our conversation with him. Let's get into some 2024 draft talk with Steve Radicevich, the Bengals pro scouting director. And Steve, when... We look at this class. I know you're the pro scouting director. You did a lot of work with free agency, but it's draft week. So when we think about the depth and the strength of this class, you hear a lot of it's a strong receiver class. It's a strong tackle class. It's a strong this. It's a strong that. When you think about depth versus strength in this class, where do you think is top heavy? Where is the real depth and, and strength from your perspective as the Bengals are looking at it? So where's the real depth in this draft class? Um just off the top of my head, uh, I would say you've got quality players in the receiver group, uh, guys that I think, you know, will, you'll get a good value at, you know, in, in the middle of the rounds, guys that, you know, norm, typically would be, um, you know, top one or two round draft picks. You may be able to get that guy in the third round. Um, other other spots where there might be some, some good depth or defensive end, I do think there's some quality players there in the middle of the draft as well. Um, uh, offensive line, obviously, I, I know that, um, you know, how, how, uh, deep a tackle group is. I do think it's a, it's a good group there. Uh, and there's some quality interior offensive linemen that I think will go in the, you know, second and third type rounds. So, uh, I would just off the top of my head, I would say those are the spots that stick out. When a, a position like offensive tackle, which is obviously coveted uh, among NFL teams and you have a class like the the one we have this year where it seems like they're just going to fly off the board early, but that there is some solid depth as well over the, the first couple of rounds, at least. Is it, are you almost worried that it's going to fly off the board because you're picking 18th and then you got to wait until pick 49? How do you balance that? Because I think a lot of people just look at it and say, oh, well, it's a deep tackle class. At the same time, th those guys, as you know, are coveted and are, are likely going to fly off the board. Yeah, I think in the first round, you're going to look to try to add a, a premier level player, you know, talent guy that's going to come in and can be able to contribute right away. Um, so wherever, whatever spot that hits uh, on our roster, I think we'll, we'll look to fill it in in the rounds following that. But uh, I don't think there's ever a panic or a worry if we don't if we don't go a certain position in the first round. I, I think we feel good with the with the way we have things set up and structured after that. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you have things set up and structured. You've, over the last couple of weeks, presumably been going through your meetings, setting your draft board. Something that we tried to do last week, we tried to get through just stacking the first round, try to get into the second round, and it was a couple of hours. It's an exhausting, you know, back and forth process trying to figure out where the deal breakers are and all this stuff. How long does it take you guys to, to set your board? Is that the last couple of weeks leading into the draft, finally culminating, bringing all that information together into one board? Yeah, I would say, you know, during the season, we're, we're going into schools and we're trying to identify the prospects. We're trying to put them in rounds, uh, trying to dig up as much character and medical information as we can. Uh, and then I would say really... Uh, you know, I would say, you know, after the All-Star Games, you get a better feel for the players after spending time with them, interviewing them. Uh, February, we come back. Um, 
we gather more information, I would say really like this whole stacking process would begin end of March, early April, where, where we're starting to kind of, you know, put guys in a, in a ranking order. Is there, is it debate style? Do you guys have debates? Is it just discussion? Obviously not everyone's going to agree. I think that's, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of people picture it as the draft debates happening on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Obviously that's not the case. You guys are ironing out the board. So there aren't debates happening in real time and you can just react to the board. So what are those conversations like? And is it, are there debates? Does it get heated at times? Uh, you know, I think everyone does a really good job of respecting everyone else's opinion in, in the draft room. So I, I wouldn't say there's it never gets to the level of, of being heated. But I do think we, we do have good debates and um, and open discussions on players. And so I, I do think it's a combination of both. But again, I, I would I would never say that it gets heated in there. I do think uh, our guys do a good job of respecting, you know, whether it's the coach's opinions or uh, whoever it may be, uh, and the coaches do a good job of respecting our opinions and uh, finding common ground on on players. So you don't have anyone literally standing on or banging on tables for players. That's never happened. No good stories uh, there. Um, no, I mean, like I said, yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> definitely there's definitely that that goes on. I, I just uh, just in terms of the, the preparation and the and the work up to it, I would say it's more more of a discussion with some debate just in terms of trying to get players in the right the right spot you mentioned character earlier and i think character is certainly something that anytime the the zach taylor era especially comes up it, it gets brought up in working with him working with the staff now uh for as long as you have what it's year six year six year five year six something like that uh, is it uh do you have an idea of of the guys that are going to fit? Not not from a style football standpoint, because obviously I, I think you do. But from a, a character standpoint, all the off the field stuff, is there synergy there? Because it, it does feel like that everyone's in sync when it comes to that. Yeah, I would say there definitely is. I mean, it's been a focal part of our their off season since Zach's been here. Uh, you know, we really try to hit on on guys that love football, high energy players, uh, guys that live it, live the game. Um, you know, and are going to be uh, guys that can develop into leaders on our roster. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. If you are looking for Reds tickets, if you're looking for tickets to the next big concert that you're trying to go to, or any event all spring, all summer, all fall, well, Game Time is the app for you because. Well, they have everything you could look for from last minute zone deals. So you can save up to 60% on buying last minute deals for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and so much more. They have flash deals, zone deals, all in pricing, which shows your total upfront. So you know the exact amount you're paying without all of the hidden fees. And they have the lowest price guarantee, which means game time will credit you 110% of the difference and your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. And you get to see the seats before you purchase them right in the app. So download the app and take the guesswork out of buying tickets today by downloading Game Time. Create an account and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL, L O C K E D O N NFL, for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. When you're breaking ties as you're going through that stacking process and you're having the very respectful, everyone is trying to find common ground, nobody standing on tables, discussions in your draft rooms where we don't have any fun stories about Steve getting up and, and standing on the table for anybody he loves, unfortunately. What are the tiebreakers? Do you guys have some objective numeric or analytical kind of tiebreakers that come in or do you guys hash out each of those individually and are there still a lot of subjective factors there where stacking a draft board is a lot of art more than a science per se um yeah i would say it's more of an art but we do i mean you do look at you know the analytic part of it uh, you do try to take into account the character part of it you try to take into part the medical part of it um so there are different 
you know, tiebreakers, obviously, and a lot of it will fit to your style of scheme. You know, a certain player may fit the scheme, our scheme better than others do. So uh, you really have to take the whole player as a package and try to compare them if you're, if you're comparing, comparing one position group specifically. How big of a factor? Well, it's a huge factor, obviously, is, is age. Uh, age is a factor. But with, with the COVID year and everything like that, a, a lot of these players are older. I mean, when we were going down the list, if if they're not 23 or going on 23 or maybe 24, it, it almost seemed like they were the, the outlier at 21. There were the, and I know there are some 20-year-old prospects in this class as well. But how do you balance that when the, the entire board is a bit older th than it would have been, say, five, six years ago? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, um, you know, I, I think a lot of it, certain positions take a little bit more time to develop. And guys obviously physically take a little bit more time to mature there. Um, so, for example, yeah, a, uh, a tackle uh, that's 21, you, you, you're projecting what he's going to look like compared to this tackle that's coming up. It's 23 um, in two years down the line. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it's you're just projecting a younger player, um, but whereas a 23-year-old tackle may be more physically ready to go now. Um, does this 21 year old have more upside in future years and ability to develop and ascend beyond that 23? There, sorry, there, there are a couple of players speaking on experience and development in this class that have uh, a surprising amount of inexperience at the college level, a rare amount of inexperience in terms of snaps played at the college level, a couple of tackles that stand out, even some defensive tackles that stand out in that category. Is that a different kind of projection? then you maybe sometimes have to make where it's not necessarily that there's raw technique on tape or something like that, but it's just an inexperienced thing. It's a, have they seen all these different looks where maybe they're not getting a, a preponderance of NFL style opposition with the way the college game is going anyway. But how, how does that inexperienced weigh into things as you guys are evaluating players? Um, I think that's also part of, part of the, um, when you're evaluating players at a certain position that plays into that player's package. So when you're trying to, you know, compare, say you're comparing 10 different players at the same position group um, and you feel they're all equal, um, you know, that's, that may be a, a little bit of a concern in that, in that, um, you know, if, if, if there's a player that hasn't played as much, that may, may, may play into it. Um, so it's just, a, it's a, it is a, you know, slight red flag if there's a player that has, uh, doesn't have as much play time or experience as, as another player that may be just equal um, in terms of talent. Um, so, yeah, I think you just, again, you just have to evaluate the whole group. When when you identify, and it, you mentioned receiver, but you mentioned defensive end, so whatever position from a depth standpoint, when you ad identify in any draft that there's depth at, at a specific position, does it impact – how you would look at the early guys, given if you think there are more guys that are uh, could give you value, say in round three or four, or, or how does that impact things as you stack these guys and rank them? And again, I'm not necessarily talking about the positions you mentioned, but just in general. Yeah, um, I, I mean, people will view it differently. I have my own opinion on it. Like I think in the first two rounds, you have to come away with a guy that's going to come in and start and a guy that has the ability to be, be to be a premier type player. Um, so I think, I think there's different philosophies and there are, diff there are different ways that guys around the league view it. But in my opinion, uh, if you have a chance to get a premier high level player, um, you know, obviously you try to play the draft, the draft board as much as well as you can. And, and uh, if you feel like there's depth at defensive end and that's a position you need, um, and maybe you're you're going from a guy that you have graded uh, at nine out of ten, and you can get get this uh, a player that's at eight out of ten at, uh, around later. Obviously, you you would prefer to do that, but you just never know how it's going to shake out. There could be a run on defensive ends between those two picks, um, and you're left looking at a player that you had graded at a six out of ten. So I think in in, in any situation, you're trying to get a premier player with your first two picks. You mentioned 
premier players. You mentioned also in an interview with Jeff Hobson, I think earlier this month, that there are more first round grades in the 18 to 25 range this year than many years. And you've been at the back of the first round, well, the back of every round, the, the last couple of years. Picking a little bit earlier this year, how does that change the approach in the first round or, or change anything, I guess, in your process when you're picking a little bit earlier and you see this class as one that has more first round grades than you've seen for a few years? Uh, yeah, I think I think we feel good with where we're at. You know, obviously, I think it's it'll be uh, we're going to end up with a player that we we all feel comfortable with. That we all like and that we all feel like is going to be a contributor for us in year one. Along those same lines, I feel like a lot of time after the pick is made, we hear, you know, we had a first round grade on this guy we got in the second round, or we had a first round grade on this guy that we couldn't believe he was available to us. Is, is that just, how, how much disparity do you think there is between, you've been doing this for a while now, between different draft boards? How often does that happen where you really see the players much later than you expect them to be available based on your board? I would say a decent amount. I would say there's, you know, a good majority of the league sees, you know, they all get paid for what they do and, and they all see the players similarly. But I would say there are, you know, off the wall picks that obviously push some other players down throughout the draft. Um, but yeah, I, I would say for the most part, we all, you know, we all feel good with the way our board is set and that we'll, we'll get players to at a good value at some at some point. You mentioned first round and getting a, a starting level player, or obviously a, a contributor, someone that can come in and, and make an impact right away. How hard was it reflecting and just looking back at the past few drafts after, obviously you have Joe Burrow and, and then T Higgins in 2020. After that, you have Jamar Chase at five. And then you're moving all the way back to pick 31 when you took Dax Hill, obviously pick 28 last year. How hard is it to find those type of guys and identify them that much later uh, versus where you were a few years ago? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you've, you're, um, you can't project how those 31 picks or however it may be are going to go. Obviously, if you have a better feel for it if you're picking in the top 10. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult to just predict when you're in the bottom bottom of the first round, um, even really where we're about – we're, we're where we are, you know, kind of after us, I think, I think it gets, you know, I think there may be some guys that are second, third round players that go, you know, after our pick. So, um, but yeah, again, it's, it's always harder to predict as the later in the, in the first round you get. This episode of Lockdown Bengals is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp knows that we all need the opportunity sometimes to get something off our chest, whether it's big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you, whether it's being really sick of all of the mock drafts out there on the internet, just waiting for the thing to get there or something more serious in your life. Having the opportunity to talk to somebody who's unbiased can really help. And a lot of times it is more serious or more personally impactful than the Bengals draft plans. And that's why BetterHelp is there to make it easy for you to access someone unbiased who can provide that outside perspective. Therapy can be different for everyone. And with those problems, it's nice to have the opportunity to get things off your chest. If you're thinking of starting therapy, BetterHelp is flexible, it's easy, it's convenient, and you can give it a try right now entirely online Visit BetterHelp.com slash Lockdown. You'll get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Lockdown. This episode of Lockdown Bengals is sponsored by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL, and baseball is in full swing. FanDuel's got odds for the NFL draft right around the corner as well, and new customers right now can get $150 in bonus bets, guaranteed $150 in bonus bets, win or lose so whether it's the nhl and slap shots home runs dunks in the playoffs it's all on an app that's secure safe and easy to use right now you can look ahead at the nfl draft odds for the cincinnati bengals first player drafted offensive lineman heavily favored at minus 160 defensive lineman and edge player next at plus 210 so what are you waiting for visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet and automatic win with that 150 dollars in bonus bets guaranteed at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. 
plans obviously never survived contact with time. You talked about that with trying to find those guys at 31 the last couple of years. You can't project the way things are going to go, whether it's free agency or the draft. You, you're always pivoting, or even when the coaches get guys on the practice field for the first time. Sometimes you need to pivot when you realize something is a little bit different or has gone a different way than you expected. So along those lines, can, can you talk about how the plan for Daxel maybe has changed from the time you drafted him to what's going on now? Uh, yeah, that would probably be more more a question for the coaches than it would be for me. Um, so, yeah, I would steer that towards Lou. What's interesting about Dax is obviously he checks so many boxes from a, a prospect standpoint for sure. And last year, because he's been such a topic, that's why we have it on the list. Yeah. Last year, he's like – at least for me, outside looking in, like three dropped interceptions where he gets himself in the right spot, like the Jacksonville one comes to mind. There were a few others where he has five picks, 110 tackles. And it's like, oh, well, on paper, that's not a that's not a bad year for his first year starting at safety. What what stood out about him as a prospect uh, when, you, when you guys took him? Because obviously he's versatile and can do all of these things, and, and they're still trying to figure out exactly how he's going to fit. Um just what you said, his versatility, you know, I think we felt like, um, obviously his position in college, um, is a little bit different than where we've played him. Uh, you know, he kind of played that, um, Kyle Hamilton role, which, you know, in Baltimore where they kind of use him as a nickel and blitz him a decent amount. Um, but we feel like he's, you know, he can, he can hit on all three spots at safety, um, nickel and plug, possibly place him outside corner. So, um, yeah, I think that was one of the most attractive things about him was just the physically he has everything in his body to be a premier type player and be an elite player in the NFL. It's just finding the right home for him. Totally different question. Switching topics a little bit here, getting back to this year's draft and, and maybe reflecting a little bit on the time you've had with Zach Taylor and some evolutions in process. From your perspective, what are some big lessons learned for you recently or, or, or maybe some things that you've realized and changed in your process, whether it's new data becoming available or, you know, advanced GPS stuff that has been refined over the years or new realizations. Are there big or, or notable process changes that aren't giving away trade secrets that you can talk about? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously analytics and, and all that's picked up. Uh, significantly over the years. And I think Sam and Elizabeth do a really good job of just incorporating that into our process. So I would say that's something that we've advanced on um, a decent amount over the last few years. Uh, but that that would probably be the, the biggest thing that jumps out just in, in terms of the way things have kind of changed. And uh, when you're looking at certain players that have failed over the years and why they have failed, um, you know, was it a physical trait they had? Um, something that, you know, something that may be able to correlate with future years drafts. How important just along those lines is, is athletic testing? And I know you've been asked that, so I'm going to try to take it a step forward. If, if you have a player, three players that have great film, obviously the one that tests and has great film, that's the one that you're trying to find because they check all the boxes. But what if, someone just hits it out of the park at the combine or at their pro day, but might not have the best film versus someone that doesn't test well and runs a slower 40 than you expect, but looks fast on film or the GPS numbers track. Like how, how tough is it now to, to balance those and, and how, how much stock do you put in testing versus not testing? Uh, well, it's a, it's a tool, right? So like we have, it's information that we can gather on players and it, help, it does help us make an evaluation on, on someone, but it's not, it's not what we're primarily making our evaluation. We're, well, the most important thing for us is film and how a player plays on tape. And that's what we're, we're grading. We're not grading his 40 time. We're not grading, um, you know, um, shuttle times. I mean, that, that it is important. To, it, it's a tool, right? It's, it's something that helps kind of put this whole player's package together. Um, and at the end of the day, yeah, you may be comparing apples to apples and maybe this guy's a little bit faster and a little bit more athletic, but they're the same player. We, we feel the same about them on tape. Um, so maybe you give him the slight bump again, it, that, that may be just a tiebreaker, but it's not what we're, what we're, we're evaluating players on, a, on, you know, their testing numbers. I, I would say the film is the most important thing. So when a guy doesn't test or opts out of testing and there've been some prominent 
first round, top of the first round prospects in this draft who have opted out of testing altogether. How does that impact things? Or do fans just make way more of a big deal out of it than you guys do in the draft room? Uh, I think it depends what the reason, you know, the mm-hmm. reasoning behind it. And, um, you know, a player may may have medical issue um, that maybe led to them not being able to test for it. Uh, but obviously, you know, if they're not testing for a certain reason, there's probably, there's, there's a reason to it, right? I mean, they're, they're, um, uncomfortable with it. So I, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have to talk about it at least. It's something that you talk about, but, uh, again, the, the film is the most important thing that we, we focus on. As far as um, you and you personally, I, I don't know, Jake, if you have anything else on this year's draft, but I do, I do want to ask you before we let you go about the GM Accelerator program uh, that you're a part of. What, uh, what has that been like? And uh, I, I'm sure it, it's helped you grow. Oh, it was awesome. It's a, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, they bring executives from, from uh, around the league. Uh, they had speakers come talk to us, um, you know, talk about leadership styles and things that work and uh, how to present yourself in, in front of a group. Um, so Belinda Gardner put it together from the NFL League office. She did a phenomenal job. Um, and it's also a really good networking opportunity just to meet other people around the league um, that are in similar situations and that are um, that were fortunate to get the invite there. So it was a uh, really cool experience. Um, and again, it was uh, it was a one time event this last uh, when it was right after the season. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I can't even remember the, uh, But yeah, no, it was a, it was a great event and uh, very well run. Glad to see you get to be a part of that and appreciate all the insight here as we look ahead to the 2024 NFL Draft just around the corner, Steve. Appreciate the time and insight as always and hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you guys having me on. Really good stuff there from Steve Radicevich, the Bengals director of pro scouting and Jake, obviously, it's a huge week at Paycor Stadium. I will be there, and we will have you covered all week long. We have Joe Goodberry on tap this week and our predictive mock drafts. And then it is time for the 2024 NFL Draft. We will have you covered, so subscribe on YouTube, follow wherever you get your podcasts. And for Jake Lisko, I'm James Rapine. Thank you so much for listening to the Locked On Bengals Podcast.